Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are on the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest with my guy, my friend, my oh, buddy. Oh, wow. All of that? Wow. Wow. Yeah, you, you know, this is my first time up here, man. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we're going to go here. I got some bones to pick with everybody. Before we even... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're trying, no, kidding, yeah <laughs> you're trying to be funny. Yeah, you're trying to be funny. But I'm going to go ahead and talk All about right. it. I seen DJ Envy in Houston smoking a hookah like an Instagram model. I had never seen anything like it before. I'm talking about, I thought he must have thought he was invisible or something. He was smoking it and blowing the smoke out his nose and his mouth at the same time. <laughs> He was rubbing his nipples. I'm like, man, he must be smoking ecstasy flavor. Like, what type of hookah is that? Then he gonna point the hookah at me like Nick Cannon on Drumline. I'm like, nah, I'm straight, Sam. You keep that. You remember them five gum commercials? Yeah, 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 this is what it's like to chew five gum. This is what it's like to smoke ecstasy flavor. He was. <laughs> I'm like, man, this he didn't man. change the filter. Nah, nothing. man, he was hitting that hard. I was like, slim on drugs now. Uh, uh -oh. Angela. Good morning, beautiful. Good morning. Like, you the only person I know that got a new job and keep coming to the old one. Like, it don't make no sense. Like, when does the new job Look, start? You keep coming back to I the old one. I promise you, I would love to start my new job, but it started in January. January. In January, I, I know. I, she, listen, Chico, I was honestly about to leave before you walked in. Uh, I know you I were. A a listen, Angela Leave. That's her new name. <laughs> and, and Leonard, listen, man, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. You up here every day on the biggest radio show in the world. Man. Yes, yes. How come you never talk about the other show that I work for you on? Like, why don't you ever mention me on The Breakfast Club? Because you put me on some of the most... <laughs> I mean, extravagant missions in the world. You had me in Queensbridge with five white men and camera equipment. Security ain't had no pistol, and the only oh, other man. black man had on scrubs. You ain't say nothing about me. You could at least say Chico Bean made it out alive. You ain't say nothing. He's never man, you. Don't listen, get Brownville. You can Brownville. If you sent me to Brown, that ain't even the worst one. He sent me to Tennessee. <laughs> and had me asking the real Make I America Great Again I white people to give me their Confederate flags. <laughs> then he had two Nation of Islam brothers with me like it's a chapter in that part of Tennessee. <laughs> it wouldn't have been nobody that could have made it to help me get up out of there, man. Y'all terrible. I and should take over this whole out. show. Oh, I should take over. Chico Bean, ladies and welcome, Chico Bean. What, 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 what camera? I'm on this camera yes. right here. Yes. What's up, America? You are now tuning into Power 105. <laughs> this is the Brunch Brigade. That's right, the show formerly known as the Breakfast Club. I am your host, Chico go being with my co-host Linda Skin, Angela Lee, and DJ Ecstasy Flavor. That's right. We got a special, special show coming up at 945. We got the Light Skin Love Letter segment where DJ Envy will be reading three love letters. You must guess which one was written by him. The 13th caller will get a, a personalized oh, hookah. Personalized by DJ Ecstasy Flavor himself. This is the Brunch Brigade. Wake up! That's that is a good show. segment because Envy does write love letters because Gia, his I wife, do. she Tomorrow. posts them sometimes. Absolutely. Oh, for real? Yeah. yeah. Well, see, look how beautiful, brilliant and I, don't I am. Believe I believe that. Like, since segment. we're talking about it, I don't believe sometimes that Envy really wrote them. I feel like she helps him. No, I write all my love letters. Even from she would school. help him write a letter to her? I don't know, because I can't see Envy, like, doing, you know, like, writing things nicely. I have six babies. Man, you know she, think, she think you dumb. You don't even know how to write, bro. <laughs> yeah, if you'd have seen him smoking that right hookah, you'd have known he was capable of writing love letters. <laughs> I'm talking about I ain't never seen nobody smoke a hookah and rub their nipples at the same time. It was He was blowing the smoke through his teeth. I was like, yo, this dude is legendary. But that would be a good segment. Is this the Read first time up. Envy has actually acknowledged you? Uh, he yeah, you? Well, no, yeah. he did acknowledge me in Houston. I seen him okay, in Houston. Okay. He, he said me in Houston. We was, at the, yeah. we was at the turkey leg turkey hut. Leg okay. And um, I think the reason why he acknowledged me is because the owner of the turkey leg hut is so aggressively hospitable. Yeah, like, yeah, he the yeah, most yeah. Be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He go a bottle of 1942 and three kids to claim on your taxes. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like if he didn't say something to me, shout out to Led, he would have, you know, said something to him about not saying something to me. They have a dress so. code there now. You see that? They have. A, they should have a dress code. You because think so? I've been there on times where it's like, you know, you you looking like you in the strip club and it's it's a little much, you know. I mean, I enjoyed it, but, you know, you got your kids. You don't want them to know what that is, so I feel them. But th it's a business that, I mean, mm -hmm. the line will be wrapped around the corner, mm -hmm. so you think you got a line going down the street with people with thongs and their titties out and all that. You don't want wow. people riding like down the street to see that. Be there. You bring people in, their families and everything. My kids went, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they ain't go I that day you were smoking that. that hookah. I tell you that. They the judge you that day. <laughs> oh, Turkey Lake Hut got hookah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hookah. Well, well, we I, in Turkey Lake Hut. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. They got a hookah. I don't know if anybody else can get them, but they had one for Envy, the ecstasy flavor. <laughs> Dang. So they got drinks and hookah at Turkey Yeah, they got drinks, hookah, <laughs> ecstasy everything. Ecstasy flavor, hookah. I haven't been used to it so long. <laughs> it's a vibe. Yeah, it's dope. It's dope, man. But, you know, I'm happy to be up here with y'all, you man. You doing your thing, time, man. All the way. You in uh, a movie, Dirty Third? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I shot that in Houston as well. So, you know, it's a uh, remake of the movie that they did back in the day. And, um, you know, I was excited to do it because I mm -hmm. love Houston as a as a city, mm -hmm. man. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful city. And they always show love down there. So I was excited about being in the movie. It's coming out in a couple weeks, I think. Okay. Yeah, not next week. You know what I mean? I think it's coming out then. What's the most fun about everything that you're doing right now, man? The most fun? Uh, well, I would say the most fun is just being able to, you know, be happy with everything that's going on. You know, mm -hmm. I done been through a lot. You know, I lost my mom last yeah, year to COVID. Yeah. You know, so, you know, when you go through that type of trauma, you really have to, you know, kind of replace the hole that's filled when you lose your matriarch like that. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I find a lot of solace in, in just knowing that what I do brings other people so much mm -hmm. joy, you know, and the response that I get. So it's just like being in New York. I love this city because when I came up here, I didn't. I didn't have anything. I was mm -hmm. just a nobody that was trying to make something of myself. So every time I come up here, I love the feeling that I get. Even though I've, you know, made a name for myself, I still get that same nostalgic feeling that I had when I wasn't anybody and I was trying to make it work. That's why I love New York so much. So it's just the feeling overall that I think is the best part. You, you one of them rare comedians, though, that literally takes your life and brings it to the stage or brings it to whatever you do. Because yeah. I, I remember when your mom passed and you was – telling a story that sounded like it could have been a stand-up bit, mm -hmm. but it was real life. Yeah, it's a true story. I mean, because that's the way I was raised. Man, I have a unique upbringing, to say the least. I say my mother raised me in reverse because a lot of the coddling and everything that you see a woman give their child, especially somebody like me, my father got murdered when I was two years old, so it was just me and my mom. And she was not protective in any way. You know, she was, get out there. You got to learn how to be a man. Mm -hmm. And then once I became a man and she saw that I was functional and everything that she trained me to do, that's when she opened up to me and started letting me know all of the things that she kept to herself mm -hmm. when I was young. So by the time she passed away, we was locked in. And it, I had no inhibition about talking about our relationship. Like I always say, like when she first passed away, I watched her pass away. I watched her die, held her hand, rubbed her back, and she passed away. And then I had to go home and tell my little brother that she was gone. And that next morning, I mean, we cried all night. And that next morning, we was looking at each other like, you know, we got to get the information to take to the funeral home. Which one of us going to search the room? Because I know that dildo in there, and I don't want to find shut it. Up, man. I don't want to find it, bro. I know it's in there. I know my mama. Man, it's in there. Up, I swear to God. That's why I was like, bro, it's in there. I don't want to find it. I, I, I don't want to be. I'm serious, bro. Listen, I don't want to be. Angela, don't you have the toys that you use in your room? Every woman has them. My mama ain't no different. Was it Rose? I wasn't looking. My brother, you got to ask him. I refuse to go in there. But, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's just like I said, it's just a process. I miss her every day you know what i mean uh I, I you know it's Stupid. i'm a walk a reflection of of what she made me because she did it on her own you know it's hard for a woman to raise a man and she always used to tell me i can't teach you how to be no man mm -hmm. some things you're gonna learn on your own but i'm damn sure gonna teach you how not to be a bitch and that's what she did tell him how you almost swung on the funeral director oh listen man what the hell listen man Black businesses, salute to Gilly. You know, I seen him go through what he went through yesterday mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. airport. You know what I mean? He the first rapper to ever check his own bag for the police. <laughs> Put that out there, Gilly. You the first rapper to ever check your own bag. Soldier Boy ain't did that yet. So no, you I mean, the first. How many times has Gilly been stopped that he knew how to search his yeah, own bag? Yeah, he knew how to search his own bag. That right there is a skill set. You know what I mean? Wallow probably told him, like, bro, I've been in jail for 20 years. If they ever tell you to search your bag, go left, right, then up, down like a cheat code. But um, I used the black funeral service, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because my mother passed away from COVID. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what they, when she was in the hospital, they had her something called prone, which was on one side of her body to try to open up her lungs. So I couldn't see the other side of her face. Mm -hmm. So everybody that I called didn't have any experience with dealing with COVID deaths. This one guy that I called, he had experience. He told me every answer to every question that I had before I can ask him. So I chose to use him, but he was in New Jersey. Now my mother passed away in DC. I'm born and raised in DC, of course. So when he had to come get her body, they were giving him problems on the transfer. So he called me one night. It was, she was probably had been dead a week now. She called me like, yo, man, they're giving me problems getting mom's body. Do you mind if I just sign your name and fax this paperwork over so I can get your mom's body? I said, no problem. Now, mind you, I done met him already. I done paid him for all the services. You know, next day they called me like, yeah, uh, Mr. Bean, uh, we were going to release your mom's body, but the funeral director signed your name as Chico Bean. 
Messed up, man. The nigga put Chico Bean on the paper. Was it Envy? To get, huh? Uh, shut up. It might have been. Nah, Envy wouldn't have known what to put because he don't know who I am. But yeah, that, that's a true story. So it's like the process that I went through, you know, it taught me a lot about just myself because mm -hmm. I dealt with so much death. You know, mm -hmm. death was one of the first things I had to learn how to deal with and my father being murdered. So, you know, and then my uncle got killed who was like my father. I've lost multiple people mm. to violence growing up. You know, and, and death was a part of my life, so I felt like I was prepared mm -hmm. to deal with it whenever it came, but your mother's different. Like, it, you know, it ripped a hole in me that I've been trying to fill ever since, but the process of going through planning a funeral and doing all of that mm -hmm. shit changed me as a person. So I tell people all the time now that the book of my life with my mother in it has the end on it. I can't add no more chapters. So if you mm -hmm. still have the luxury of having your mother on this plane, appreciate the fact that you can add chapters because one day if the circle of life go the way it's supposed to go, then you're going to have to put the end on yours too. So, you know, that's just how it goes. And, and didn't the director almost drop? Uh, uh, so, uh, no, 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 no. He didn't almost. Now, this is an exclusive. I don't think I have even talked about that before. Oh, never mind. I no, 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 no. I don't mind. Like, oh, okay, this is, okay. I'm not going to put him out there mm -hmm. because, you know, he actually did a good service. But uh, it wasn't him either. The dude that uh, was transferring my mother's body, me and my manager go to, you know, view my mama's body to see before she goes out to New Jersey. And the dude who's taking her body out of the back of the van sees me and like, oh, shit, going to Chico Bean mode, mm -hmm. something Envy would never do. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. he <laughs> recognized me and acknowledged me and was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so he freak out and see me walking, and then he pull her out, and then drop her body on the ground. God oh, my damn. goodness. So oh, then man. he goes to try to pick her up again, and it drops her again. And then I say, man, I walk up to him. He's sweating. I'm talking about, I ain't never seen nothing like this. I mean, he pouring sweat, just dripping sweat. And I'm like, bro, you you okay? You, you you straight? He was like, I'm just I'm just so nervous. I'm like, look, man, it's somebody that's really special to me in this bag, man. You got to you gotta get yourself together. So, you know, I calmed him down. We picked her up, put her back on the thing. My manager walked over and gave him some type of pep talk, like, nigga, if anything then fell off her in this goddamn <laughs> bag, I'm going to kill you. But um, the the the, way, the reason I was so calm in that manner is because it had took so long for her to get to that point. Now, mm -hmm. mind you, if this would have happened the day that she died or the day after she died, I probably would have did something completely different in right, that right, parking right. lot. But the fact that I had enough time to you know, get myself together and mm -hmm. figure out how I felt about her being gone. And by that time, I knew that that was just the remains. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything that I needed to be, you know, he ain't punched my mom and drop right. her. This is her boy, body. Boy. So I was able to keep myself calm. And it's just, you can use that as an example of, you know, just learning grace and patience mm -hmm. because that was a level of patience that I would have never thought that I had before I had it. So, mm -hmm. you know, that that's a true story, though. That it, happened. It was nice that your mom had a chance to see you be successful. Too. That's the best part of it, man. Like she had a chance and an opportunity to actually see me make it and be a part of my process. Because, like I said, she raised me by herself. My mother was getting up at three o'clock in the morning to go to work every day my whole life. So for her to be able to see her son make it, I know that she had. I mean, she loved me to death, and that's mm -hmm. the biggest part that I've been having to feel now is just knowing that that matriarch is not here. That's the first time I've ever felt loneliness in my life is mm -hmm. when I lost her. You know, I'm I don't sure give she a fuck. Hey, man, listen, I don't give a fuck about what nobody think about me because of the way, you know, this nigga, this is what this is. Uh, you know what I mean? Wait, did you? Now, come on, Angela. Why are you looking like that? You... Now, I just don't know why would you braid that? Why would I braid well, it? I thought she was about to say, why would you take your hat off? Oh, no. Nah, I mean, both now, of them. I, actually, I'm, I think it's great that you are... Um... Confident enough to do it? Yeah, because during the pandemic, I feel like that's when we really... That's when to... we kicked it off. Yeah. And, I, and the reason why I did this is just to show people, man, fuck what people think about you. If mm -hmm. it make you happy, do it. I'm proud of my side braids. I don't give a fuck what nobody <laughs> say. And the reason why I would braid it is just because I could. I, I think... <laughs> The re for real, I think the reason why I'm, you know, in the position that I'm in as far as, as I'll just say the people that really are supporters of everything that I do is because they see that it's genuine. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care what anybody has to say about mm -hmm. me. You're entitled to your opinion, but I'm entitled not to give a fuck about it right. just like you're entitled to have it. So, you know, this is just a part of who I am at this point. And just I, let it grow. And let it grow out. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about I can, and it's three hairstyles I'm going to get before I cut it. I'm gonna get a jury curl. I'm gonna get the uh, the Frankie Lyman. What's love got? I mean, the uh, the, the why do fools fall in love? And the big red from the Fire Hot Beast. After that, then I'm cutting it off. With well, the Frankie Lyman, you probably gonna have to get like a little weave in the front. Nah, nah, nah. I'm just gonna do the swoop over. I got enough oh, now. Yeah, I'm gonna you get, a, you. get a little you bang down yeah. all the way. You know, mm -hmm. I appreciate y'all for helping me with hairstyles. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, I, like like, he he I told him. I told you that yesterday. I got the PRP. 
Well, and, and I grew it out when you when yeah, I said, well, he, when, when he I did when I was doing the Hotline yeah. Headline yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah, he baby. came on there looking like the nigga from Lean on Me. Yeah. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, I am the head nigga in charge. I was like, damn, Slim, you could remake that movie all the way. <laughs> oh, man. Now, when we getting a Chico Bean stand-up special? Or do you even want to do that right now? Nigga, you need to give me a stand-up special for all them specials you be making me shoot for you. <laughs> does, he pay, does he pay you well for that? Does he what? Pay you well for that. Say that one more time. Go to Brooklyn, Queens, he can't Tennessee. hear you. Does, does he pay you well for that? Say, huh? Does he pay <laughs> that you ain't me. Yeah, it's just, that that's, I was waiting on that. Yeah. I'm not even going to let you. Yeah, I, I don't think he pays me. I don't no. think he pays himself well for that. But <laughs> that's probably a reason why he don't talk about it up here. You know what I mean? We've but, been, but we been at Viacom for a while. That's Viacom. Yeah, right? I know. Yeah, yeah. but, uh, you know, we working on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, uh, you know, of course, we got the 85 South. Then we doing something special with that. But, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the stuff that, you know, I've been doing is just, you know, just I don't rush anything. Mm -hmm. I'm on my own clock, not nobody else's. So when it's time, it's time. But I'm working on it. You know, I got a couple of shows coming up. I'm excited about the Wilbur Theater in Boston. You know, I'm doing a run with the MGM, all the casinos. So I'm excited Fox about Woods. that. Foxwoods Casino and all that. And uh, so, you know, I'm I'm prepared whenever it come. You know what I mean? Whenever it come, I'm just not going to rush it because everybody else says, you need this, you right. need that. Because you think about the game now. Yeah. Now it's Netflix. But 10 years ago, it was HBO. That's right. So we don't know where the game going to go. You just make sure you stay in it long enough to be able to move whichever way it Shit, it feel like it's YouTube now, too. When you yeah. see what, like, Andrew and Andrew's show's doing and all of them. Like yeah, it's all different types of platforms, mm -hmm. you know. So the game is different. I tell people all the time. I remember when uh, Ryan Davis was up here, he said I always used to call him stupid for living in L.A. Mm -hmm. And that was true. Because you don't have to do it the same way that you did it back in the gap. That's like right. in the 90s, you had to be in L.A. or mm -hmm. New York to get recognized. Now, all you have to do is just have a presence. And I started in North Carolina. You know, I started at the Greensboro Comedy Zone. And I told myself when I first started doing comedy that I'm going to make a presence felt where I live. Mm -hmm. And then even if I go to L.A., I always have something to go back to because I done built a following. So that's, that's right. just the way you got to do it to all the young people out here thinking about doing this as a living, making a living off entertainment. Just make a following. Build your following wherever you at, and they'll come to you now. They, you ain't got to go to where they are. With everything so sensitive, do you ever watch what you say now? Because the world is sensitive. It wasn't where, you, where it was five years ago or ten years ago. Everything is so sensitive. Yeah, you got to be mindful of that because it's so easy to be offended now. We were just talking yesterday. Like, mm -hmm. I was watching In Living Color. And mm -hmm. that, couldn't happen that couldn't be on TV now. But, you know, people were offended back then, but it just took longer for you to know that they were offended. Mm -hmm. And you had to put an effort in to be offended. You had to get up and make a picket sign and go to Tower Records That's or right. wherever they were shooting the show at and stand outside. Mm -hmm. It took effort. Now it doesn't take any effort to be offended. I think that's the reason why it's such mm -hmm. a problem, because all you got to do is take out your phone and say something. And you can get millions of people to agree with you just from you saying something from the comfort of your couch. So you got to be careful of that but at the same time as long as you telling your truth i don't care who get mad at my truth that's mm -hmm. that's on you you know have what i mean have you ever apologized for something uh like for offending anybody he hasn't had to yet yet god damn <laughs> leonard what the fuck why you wow. just gonna put that on me i ain't apologize you need to apologize for a lot of the shit you done said you done said kanye it. west gonna kill himself this i did man. not say that, that <laughs> yes you did said. say no, that bro you said Kanye is West said. is going to commit suicide. No, That's what not. you said. I said that he's moving like a man who feels like he's not going to be here much longer. Which means Translates. that you've been around <laughs> people who haven't been here much longer. They killed themselves and you can recognize that behavior I, I reckon, Yeah, I recognize the manic episode. And manic episodes don't end well unless somebody in the I don't care that you put that jargon on there. You know what you said. <laughs> what but I you said. know, some comedians feel like it's a joke. I, if I start apologizing for things, that's a slippery slope. And then people will come at me and I'm I don't want to be apologizing for jokes that don't have ill intentions. Yeah, I mean you if as long as like you said that it's not malicious. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? One of the one of the things that helps me is I before I started doing comedy full time, I was a QP, a qualified professional. And what that is is I work with people with substance abuse issues, you know, people on the, you know, uh autism spectrum, all different types of stuff. And one of the first rules of working with people that have disabilities is that they tell you they want to be treated normally. They don't want you to look at them like they're lesser than. They don't want you to look at them like something is wrong with them. And in that, I've seen just being around people like that, if they can laugh at themselves and they can, you know, be okay with something that they have no control over, why can't you be okay with something you do have control mm. over? You have control over what you allow to offend you. Words are words. As long as the actions behind the words are something that is going to cause you detriment, you should be able to take somebody saying anything that they say as long as it doesn't affect you directly. Now, mind 
you, we do live in a time where you have to be sensitive about what you say. But me personally, I don't get on stage to hurt people's feelings. I get on stage to tell my truth and make people laugh. So if you get offended by that, then it is what it is. I was giving some great advice. If you do a joke that don't offend somebody, then it's a horrible joke. So, you know, you got to take that in. And, 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 and you never know what people's triggers are. You don't know personally. Yeah, you know and what you mean? can't tell nobody what they can get offended by. Yeah. That's that's true. You know, if you choose, you have the right to be offended by whatever you want to be offended by. But I just think that now that we live in a time where it's so easy to be offended, I think if you took away social media, it'd be a lot easier mm -hmm. for you to say whatever it is you want to say because people don't have the, the energy to really get up and go out and share show that they really mean that they feel the way that they feel mm -hmm. so i just i just try to you know i told a line i know it's certain things that you can't say i mean the 90s was different you know you yes, look at the were. 90s the 90s was a different game like i said i was watching in living color i was watching some 60 minute interviews from the 90s and it was like ain't no way you can get away with this now so I mean, Man, you know who the most ruthless interviewer was? Who? Barbara Goddamn ba Walters. Barbara, yeah, all Go the way. Go watch old Barbara Walters interview. Oh yeah, it was vicious. Go watch the sitcoms. I'm not the sitcom, the talk shows. Jenny Jones and Ricky Lake yes. and the original yep. Oprah and all yep. that. Like, but I'm glad I was raised in that era because for me, I think that. A lot of things, you know, people complain about the way the world is now a lot. Like, man, it wasn't like this when I was growing up. I'm kind of, you know, on both sides of the fence. There's certain things that I'm glad uh, in use now that wasn't in use when I was little. And I'm also upset that there's certain things that can't be said and done. Like watching the old Jenny Jones and Jerry Springer, like I'd love that era just because you see the freedom mm -hmm. of, right. you know, what people just had the freedom to even get on TV and say. But, you know, I also appreciate that, you know, you have mental health talk now, like mm -hmm. like depression. There wasn't no depression when I was little. Hell you know how depressed I would have been mm -hmm. if I could have used depression to get out of school? Like, ain't no way. Bad thing. That's a great thing because you think about it like, like I said, talking about my mom. It's so much that I realized as a man that I didn't understand as a young man. Like, for example, you know, I love my mother to death. But I never had to be in a relationship with her. I don't know who she was in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Just right. like I don't know who she was as a person having to raise two boys by herself. So if or I who had, she was before she was your parent. Or who she was. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find that out until she passed away, mm -hmm. who she was before she was my mother. So when you think about that, it was so much that she was concealing and hiding from us that if we had a outlet for as a family that we could have went and talked about mental health mm -hmm. it could have helped our situation tremendously because now you have children who are you know being affected by this social media in ways that we never had to deal with i went back to my alma mater winston salem state and talked to the you know kids in my program that i graduated from the communications program and all of them was like man i just feel like i ain't moving fast enough i ain't moving fast mm -hmm. enough i'm like how old are you 18 and i understand it because they up against the phone I only had to, you know, see what was around me, who went to school with me, the success stories mm -hmm. at the school. And you went to an HBC, you know it was two, mm -hmm. three niggas with money. Well, you went to Hampton, so it might be different for you. <laughs> so, a lot but, of drugs uh, in Virginia at that a, time. It's a lot of, a lot yeah. of money in Hampton. But, you know, usually you're only competing with what you see. But now they got to compete with everybody. they competing with their phone. Mm -hmm. Everybody's highlight reel. Mm -hmm. Everybody highlight reel mm -hmm. is in front of you. So now you feel like you are inadequate because you got to compete with that. So we didn't have to deal with that. So that creates a level of mental, uh, you know, in, you make you unstable in ways that we never had to deal with. So I appreciate that, you know, those conversations are going on. But I do wish the world was a lot less sensitive. You know, the thing about Chico, man, you know, you hear Chico talk, you clearly can tell he's intelligent. You don't, I don't know if you talk about your educational background enough. Why? Why should I? It's because it, it, I mean I don't think that's something that you know you know you should hang your hat on because I know a lot of people that went to school that's dummies and I know a lot of people who never went to school that are brilliant. Mm. So I just think that that's something that you should utilize on your own. If somebody asks me did I go to college or did I get an education, of course, but I'm not gonna hang my hat on that because I feel like I'm shorting myself because there's somebody who didn't have that level of education that you can learn from. That's real. I'm open. I don't, I'd say all the time, one of my mantras is I don't know nothing. So therefore mm -hmm. I'm always open to learning. Mm -hmm. I'm always open to having mm -hmm. a conversation with somebody who can teach me something no matter what I read out of a book. I think that's a problem with people now. You you see all these people regurgitating information that they just read without doing any of the no research life experience. to understand yeah. or the life <clears throat> experience. So, you know, school don't teach you that. Life teaches you life experience. So what so. was your major? 
Uh, communications. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I did, yeah. You, thank you, Emmy. You being my friend <laughs> now. That's what it is, man. You still tuned into the Brunch Brigade. I am your host, Chico Bean. Just in case you was wondering, that's right. Coming up, we have the next segment. When does Angela leave? That's right. We're gonna have all of the callers come in. The thirteenth caller who guesses the date that she actually leaves will get a ticket to come see her work wherever she's going. That's right. This is the Brunch Brigade. Wake up. These well, who, are good segments. Who, off who, the that is a good segment. Way. But who instilled that in you early, though? <laughs> just to just just to educate yourself, whether it was academically or through books or through life experience, like who who put that in you? Everybody. Mm-hmm. I like I said, you know, um, my father was murdered, so mm-hmm. I never had that relationship. But you know, I've learned to look at the bright sides of of death and bad, the things that most people look at, at detriments in life. Like for example, I never knew my father, but I also never had to live up to a standard for me. Mm. I never had to live up to what he wanted me to be. Mm. And I also never had to see him do anything that disappointed me or see him do anything that made me feel like, damn, man, why I got to use this as an example. So I was able to take influence from everybody because I didn't have to worry about my daddy coming up and saying we don't like him. I saw you put a post up the other day that said a woman teaches you. Uh, uh, how to? I can't remember exactly. Yeah, what it yeah, was. I don't about, that's from my man Jay Barnett. Right, yeah, yeah. He yeah, basically yeah. was saying oh, men need men to reaffirm. Right, your man, a man teaches you what to believe. Yeah. So because I didn't have the the man that created me there, as unfortunate as it was, I still was able to take influence from places that I'm sure I probably wouldn't have been able to or mm-hmm. wouldn't have known because. I would have been up under my daddy. Mm-hmm. So my uncles, you know what I mean? All of my uncles, all of the people, I come in a, up in a household, I live with all my family. I was surrounded by everything. I had two uncles that was dope dealers. I had, you know, two cousins that was like uncles and aunts that was on drugs. My mother, my Aunt Mary, you know what I mean? My Uncle Ricky, who was the youngest, who I, you know, gravitated towards, and that's where I got my musical influence from. But I come up from in a household where there was no gray area. Mm-hmm. Like, I never got anything hidden from me. And I've always had responsibility in my life. There's never been a time where I didn't have responsibility. So you learn that. Like I've learned to be okay with walking a road less traveled because I've always had to. When my friends was playing football and you know, outside riding bikes, I had to walk to the Safeway to get the groceries with a cart at 9, 10 years old. Like wow. I got my first job when I was nine working at Bluebird's Barbershop, brushing people off for dollars. So you learn in those experiences through life when you're walking down the street mad that you got to take care of responsibility. Mm-hmm. During those times, you pick up how to be okay with things that you don't realize in that time. But when you become a man, it trained me. A lot of my friends, you know, that I grew up with are still in the same place, not because they have to be, just because they haven't learned how to be okay with moving outside of the box, Mm -hmm. you know? For you growing up in D.C., did you pay attention to politics? No, 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 not at all. Marion Barry is the greatest statesman of all time, like, to us, because of what he did for the community. Like, Marion Barry uh, for D.C. is what I wish that all, you know, inner cities had somebody like that that worked in our favor. Like, he created the summer job program where everybody in the city from 12 to 18 were able to get a summer job. And that saved so many lives in the Mm. city because, you know, D.C. was a very violent city growing up. And, you know, of of course you still had people who fell victim to it, but us being able to go get those jobs kept a lot of us out of jail. And, you know, one thing I say about D.C., which makes, in my opinion, the, the hardest city to grow up in when it comes to politics is, if you from you from where, Angela? Brooklyn. You from Brooklyn, Queens, Queens, and Monk's, Monk's Corner, Corner, South Carolina. All of y'all send people to where I'm from to get things changed in your communities. Mm-hmm. But these people that you send ride past us, living in the conditions that you want changed every day, and don't do nothing. So. Wow. You got to understand that we come from the city where the capital is right here. Then two blocks down, you got certain quarters, one of the worst hoods in the world. And they ride past this place. They come get food in these communities and they walk right past us and see us every day. So we don't have no no reason to pay attention to politics because they don't pay attention to us. And we get Mm. to see them not pay attention Mm. to us. So D.C. is a different city, man. You know, and I hate that. You know, it's been gentrified the way that it has. You know, now I go home and it breaks my heart. The places that I grew up in frequented uh, Best Buys and Whole Foods and all that now. And there's nothing wrong with that in with improving the community. But it is something wrong with improving the community when you know the people who were living there aren't going to be able to benefit from the improvement. That's real. That shit is horrible, man. So, you know, salute to the whole D.C., man, the whole city, man. And everywhere I go, I wear it on my back because I know that, you know, the city that I grew up in is being demolished, is being wiped away, and the people that come from it are being scattered all around Mm -hmm. the world. So, you know, I mean, 
We don't really pay attention to politics to answer your question, though. I never really cared. Long as Marion Barry was the mayor, that's all we cared about. What made you plant your flag in North Carolina the way that you did? I went to college. Yeah. You know what I mean? D.C. Tag, D.C. Leap, which was a program that Bill Clinton put in the place right before he left office that let D.C. students pay in-state tuition wherever they went. Oh, wow. Which really meant that D.C. paid the difference. So whatever the difference is between in-state and out-of-state tuition, they paid. So once they did that, an influx of us were able to go to school. Because mm -hmm. without that, I wouldn't have been able to go to college. I didn't even know nothing about college. It wasn't until my Uncle Reggie got murdered in 2002 that I even started to pay attention to school because I wanted to be the, in the streets. You know what I mean? I've always been blessed to be good at whatever I did. And, you know, I, you know, it's documented. I was always a hustler, like my whole life. I've been getting my own money since I was nine, and I was good at it. So that's all I wanted to do. But once I saw him get murdered, it, it changed my whole perspective because I knew he was ten times tougher than I ever could be. Mm -hmm. So if that was his fate, I thought he was above it. You know, you think certain mm -hmm. people are invincible. Mm -hmm. They can't have certain things happen to them. So I thought he was above having, you know, that be his fate. He had been to jail already and survived that, so I knew he was a warrior, a gladiator in that regard. But once I saw him get killed and once I watched him pass away, it was like, you know what, man, this is if this is his fate, then I know I'm going to jail or the, to the graveyard a whole lot quicker than if I go to school. So I went on a college tour. I paid for me and my man to go on a college tour. We went to all the HBCUs from D.C. to Florida. Morgan. Morgan. I mean, Howard. Howard uh, BCU, BCU uh, but uh, Virginia House. State, all of them, mm -hmm. all of them, we and uh, all the way down to Florida A&M, and yep. I went to the ones in North Carolina, and mind you, you know, going to an HBCU, whenever they had fall break, the school be dead, mm -hmm. so whichever ones was on fall break, I'm like, oh, this dead, Hampton was on fall break, a and was on fall break, then I went to Winston-Salem State and saw 20 girls before I saw one dude. I was like, nigga, this ain't that bad. <laughs> I'm coming down here. And then we went to uh, Morehouse, and I like Morehouse, but then I found out it was an all-dude school, school, but yeah. not knowing that Spelman was right, right there. Right. They didn't tell us that. They were just like, this is all-boys school. They came out dressed like Braxton and Hart in the Brig. I was like, nah, I'm straight. <laughs> I'm going with the 20 girls at. But, uh, you know, I went to Winston-Salem State for that, to go to school. And I thought I was a man before I went to North Carolina, mm -hmm. but I became a man in North Carolina. That's like, I learned how to be a man because that was the first time I didn't have, you know, anybody in close proximity that I can lean on when things got rough and times got hard. I thought I knew how to move as a man, but I always had the luxury of going back to Wanda House. And All that's right. something that a lot of men don't realize. You think you hustling and you think you moving around, but you're really just still depending on your mama. Mm -hmm. You're just doing it a little bit less than your partner might be doing it or the environment might allow you to. But the reality is, if you can go home to mama house, you know you got somewhere to go. But That's when right. you separate and it's five hours away, then you can't just go and get a meal and go and get your clothes washed. What you going to do? Mm. And it's things as simple as that is what I realized became yeah. made me a man. So once I decided to become a comedian, I stayed because I knew going home wouldn't have been the best decision for me. Does not having that now make you feel like less grounded? No, not okay, at all. Okay. Because I've, I, you know, I've been trained. I know right, how to right. do it now. You know, I'm domestic. You know, that's one of the reasons why I don't need no girlfriend or need no woman to do nothing for me because the women in my life taught me how to be self-sufficient in those ways, not mm -hmm. to depend on anybody. Now, of course, the thing that I miss the most is being able to get those phone calls mm -hmm. and just the check-ins mm -hmm. and all of that. But as far as the things that I need to do for me, man, I'm good. I am already got that training. All right. Chico Bean, your next Chico show. Bean. No, 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 we're not doing really that. Y'all niggas not about to hit me with the Alderman interview. Y'all not about to give me 20 minutes and then, no, You're no. 40. No, this was the brunch brigade. This is That was the breakfast club. This is the I brunch 40 brigade. 40 minutes, right? Yes. Yeah. No, it doesn't matter. Listen, coming up on the brunch brigade, that's right, we got another segment where Lynn the Skin will be giving his morning makeup ritual. That's right. <laughs> Morning makeup, all the things that he used, all the soaps, all the creams, all the lipsticks and chapsticks. And the winner will receive the personal package from Lynn the Skin. This is the Brunch Brigade. Wake up! I use Jones Road, by the way. Okay. See, there you go. All well, the Chico way. Bean. All the way. Chico Bean, give me your info, man. Your hey, Instagrams man, and Twitters and all that. Chico Bean everywhere. You know what I mean? Angela, I'm surprised, man. You ain't come with it. I appreciate you. you I know. was about to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask me one. I'm going to go ahead and let you no, ask me No, because when you were talking about how you're self-sufficient, Right. We've had a conversation up here before. I did think there's a couple of things I wanted to jump oh, in on. Lord. Go ahead. Nah, this is the brunch brigade, baby. Oh, Y'all working overtime every time I come up here. <laughs> go ahead, Angelie. I, I got you. you have, no, what, where no, you going? You can't, I got to go to the doctor. He got to go to the doctor. Charlamagne was supposed to go with me. She about to ask you if you suck your own dick. You, you no, sure you want to do this? <laughs> 
I was not going to ask that. I don't know where he came from. No, no, no. You, you got to go no, to the doctor. No, Hold no. up. Just let her ask the question. I was going to ask you, how do you feel about um, when it comes to dating for a woman, do you think women should be independent in a relationship? Do I think women should be independent? While they're in a relationship. While they're in a relationship, you know, you just mean as 50, an independent um, human being, like I can, I'm self sufficient. I can handle all these things because a, a lot of people talk about how women are so independent now that it's hard for them to be in relationships because guys kind of want you to be a little dependent on them. I mean, I think independence is masked as being an adult. You're an adult, so it's certain things that you should do on your own. That's you shouldn't, true. you know. I think. Uh, a lot of women are looking for men to do the things for them that their father was supposed to. Mm. You know what I mean? And and the unfortunate part is you can't be looking for somebody to be your daddy and not be obedient like a child would. Mm. So the independence that men are looking for, dependence rather, that men are looking for in women, uh, they're looking for them to be in a sense of, you know, like you've seen the memes that people put out, you know, the daddy hand me the salt and then the boyfriend and the father reach. You know what I'm saying? I think it's that. Men want that level of being able to provide a woman with that. But at the same time, if you're not going to look at this man as somebody who can provide you with the level of protection, assurance, you know, safety that your father would, then it's a waste of time. So your independence should come anyway as a woman, I think. So what do you think about the bills? In a relationship, the bills. Yeah, like is it half paying and the half, bill? or do you feel like you should be paying for, like what? What's your breakdown? I feel like you should do whatever it is you're capable of doing. Communication is key; it's the most important part of any relationship. So if you're comfortable with paying half the bills, then do that. But if as a man, that's you know something that you want to do, make sure you're in a position to but be able I'm to do that. I'm asking you, what you me? Yeah. Uh, well, if I would never be in a relationship, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> I don't never want to be married or be in a relationship. Or so. you don't never want to be in a relationship? No. Not even, not even a girlfriend? No. Why would I do that? That is the no. Look at my man over in the corner. You wish somebody would have said that on the mic before. He from no. Ghana. He want five wives. Oh, uh, good for you. <laughs> good for you. As long as you can afford them, you should be able to so have. You don't want to live with anybody. No, 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 no. no. I don't. No. Uh, uh. You know, like I said, I you know I get most of my you know interaction and, and relationship you know, dependence from the environment that I come on, come from, rather. Mm -hmm. And I watched my mother go through my whole life never finding a man to keep it real with her and tell her exactly what it was that was going on. So I'm being, I'm out here just trying to be the nigga that my mother never had. I don't have no lies to tell you. <laughs> I'm, I don't have no lies to tell you. I feel like if somebody would have gave Wanda the opportunity, she would have been a hell of a soldier for somebody who was worth it. And it would have made our life easier. Mm -hmm. So for me... I don't have no lies to tell you. You're not going to be the only woman that I ever, that's it. It's illogical to me to even allow a woman to think that if I love you and care about you, there's no way I would allow you to think that as a man that you are going to be the only woman that I want to deal with. What if she's with. okay with you dating other people? Well, that's cool. But it's, the thing is, I'm going to be honest with you about that from the jump. My goal, my whole mantra is no victims, only volunteers. You'll never be a victim to no bullshit, only a volunteer to my truth. So you have a choice as to whether or not you want to deal with me or not. But you have to understand that you won't be the only woman that I deal with. Now, in fairness, you, have, an a, individual you, thing, have, you have a lot of men who say that and then be like, I do what I want, you do what I tell you. I'm also not that way. All right. And when it comes to women, I don't care what you do when I'm not around. As it's long as be a whatever, wild and out thing. No, well, no, it's not. It's not. I because ain't having no bunch of kids. <laughs> You know what I mean? But salute to Nick. <laughs> Shit, that nigga can take care of him. He about to have a whole nother cast. I know that nigga. I know what he doing. That's exactly what he did. He's trying to be have a whole nother cast so he can fire us. That's I'm right. hip to you, that's Nick. Right. But, that's right. But like I said, I'm not the type of person that's going to tell you I can do what I want. You do what I tell you. As long as whatever you do, don't bring me no problems. I don't care what you do. My uncle told me a long time ago, if you don't wake up in the morning and wash your pussy, it don't belong to you. It's yours. You're going to do what you want to do with it. As long as a nigga ain't mad when it's my turn, we straight. Do you take women on vacations and things nah, like that? No, I don't do none of that. I don't do none of that. You spend the night? Yeah, depending on who it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? And how safe I feel with my belongings being <laughs> there when I'm asleep. Yeah, I, I spend the night. But the thing about me, like I said, it's about it's about honesty. Women always say they want a man to keep it 100 with them until they run into one. Most of them have never had a man keep it 20 with them, so you have no idea what that other 80% entails that you think that you're looking for. The lies hurt so bad that you just think you want the opposite. But the majority of the women that I have conversations with don't want a man to be honest with them. You want a man to fit into the character that you have in your mind, and you want him to play that out in front of the world. 
I don't operate like that. This is what it is. This is what it ain't. You down with it? Cool. You're not? Cool. I like to, the way I explain it is like, we all are professors of ourselves. And I'm the, I'm the, the dean of Chico Bean University. When you, you've been to college, you've been around. When the first thing, <laughs> you've been around, lend the skin. Uh, the first thing that they teach you when you, or the first thing that you do when you come into a, a, a college, you know, classroom is they give you the syllabus. And the first week of class is you going over the syllabus so you can make a decision as to whether or not this is a class you want to take or drop. Mm -hmm. That's how I operate with women. When you meet me, I'm handing you my syllabus. This is what it is with me. You have a choice as to whether or not you want to take this course or drop it. Would you say I love you? Have you said I love you? I love anybody? all the women I deal with. Hey, oh, I, I ain't heard shit like this since Kevin Samuel. I got it. No, it ain't. No, don't put me lie. in that legacy. <laughs> don't put me. See, there you go. Now you want to say motherfuckers is going to die. You keep saying. <laughs> I did not you say that. You said Kanye West going to die. Now you going to put no, me in the I Kevin Samuel so the women can say, ah, no, oh, that nigga. I'm not. I salute the Kevin Samuels, though. I don't, you know, God rest his soul. But I'm not one of those people who's telling any woman what they need to do. I'm just telling you what I'm going to do. That's real. What you decide to do based upon that is your choice. I don't have no say-so in that. I just am going to tell you what I'm going to do and I'm not going to do. After that, it's on you. That's my man Chico Bean. Yeah, you nigga trying to go and get out. No, I like the sweatsuit. Yeah. You trying to get out of here. 85 uh -huh. South. You, you know what I mean? Okay. Chad, Chad, yeah. send me a pack. Hey, uh, and Angela, whenever you leave, let me know so I can come do your new job. Oh, absolutely. Please. Yeah. We got to get you on lip service. We would love that. Oh, yeah. I got to come do that, that too. We did so the we live can go one. It got end. very serious. Yeah. Oh, me. yeah, yeah. Salute, salute <laughs> to my girl, man. We worked on the radio together L'Oreal. down there. My girl, L'Oreal. That's my partner. But, you know, it's, ever since then, we'd have been locked in. But, yeah, I would love to come do it because, you know, you get to ask the nasty questions and yeah, all that. Yeah, we didn't get to do that here. Hey, for real, I gotta ask you before I go, though. This is gonna be the last question. Uh, <laughs> matter of fact, it's coming up in the next segment on the Brunch Brigade. Make sure you stay tuned in. Wake up, America. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs>